Sehr geehrtes Publikum, ich darf Sie sehr herzlich begrüßen. Mein Name ist Armin Schlüter, ich bin Direktor hier des Ägyptischen Museums. Ich freue mich sehr, Sie zum heutigen Vortrag von Rita Lucarelli begrüßen zu dürfen. Das ist bereits das zweite Mal, dass wir innerhalb weniger Wochen einen Gastvortrag hier haben vom MZAW, organisiert in Kooperation mit dem MZAW. Das ist für uns eine sehr schöne Bereicherung unseres Vortragsprogrammes. Ich hoffe auch für das MZAW eine schöne Gelegenheit, hier diesen Raum äh, zu nutzen. Und äh, so hoffe ich, ist es eine Neudeutsch-Win-Win-Situation für beide. Wir freuen uns in jedem Fall sehr und dafür möchten wir sehr herzlich dem Vorstand des MZAW, den SprecherInnen und der Organisatorin des MZAW herzlich danken. Uh, now I switch into English, uh, although I know that Rita Lucarelli uh, understands German very well. Um, dear Rita Lucarelli, it's an honor and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here in the Egyptian Museum. You will give us a lecture today on ancient Egyptian magic and you will come to the visit the museum together with your students of your MZAW masterclass or research seminar tomorrow. So thank you very much for your interest here in the museum and for the opportunity to let us learn something about your really exciting research projects. Um, I hope and I think that the museum can offer one or the other piece to your research topic. <laughs> and yeah, thank you very much. We are all looking forward for your presentation. And with that, I will hand over uh, the floor to Professor Hoffmann and afterwards Dr. Schütze, who will welcome you for the MZAW and who will introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Ja, vielen Dank, meine Damen und Herren. Ich spreche hier im Namen des MZAW zu Ihnen. Ich bin Mitglied im Vorstand, begrüße ganz besonders Sie, liebe Frau Lucarelli dass Sie den Weg nach München gefunden haben und für eine Woche MZAW-Gastprofessorin hier in München sind. Und ich begrüße Sie auch in meiner Eigenschaft als Vorstand des Instituts für Ägyptologie. Schließlich vertreten Sie unser Fach jetzt hier. Und damit möchte ich uns, Sie, uns gar nicht länger aufhalten, sondern gebe gleich weiter an Alexander Schütze, der Sie vorstellen wird. Guten Abend, ähm, Frau Lucarelli und ich, wir kennen uns schon einige Jahre. Tatsächlich haben wir uns einmal drei Wochen lang ein Büro geteilt an der Uni Bonn, bevor sie dann nach Berkeley gegangen ist. Und ähm, deswegen ist es mir eine große Freude, äh, Sie jetzt auch kurz ähm, Ihren wissenschaftlichen Werdegang vorstellen zu können. Frau Rita Lucarelli hat in Neapel, Rom und Leiden studiert. Ähm, bereits in ihrer Masterarbeit beschäftigte sie sich mit Spruch 178 des altägyptischen Totenbuches. In Leiden wurde sie 2005 bei Professor Bohautz mit der Arbeit The Book of the Dead of God Sechen, Ancient Egyptian Funerary Religion in the 10th Century BC promoviert. Danach war sie Dozentin ähm, äh, an der, für Ägyptologie an der Universität von Verona, wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin am Bonner Totenbuchprojekt sowie am ägyptologischen Seminar der Universität Bonn. Seit 2013 war sie zunächst Assistant Professor am Department of Near Eastern Studies, University of California, Berkeley und äh, Faculty Curator of Egyptology am dortigen Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Seit 2018 ist sie eben der Associate Professor of Egyptology. Sie war Gastwissenschaftlerin und Gastprofessorin an einer Vielzahl von wissenschaftlichen Institutionen wie der Italian Academy of for Advanced Studies in America, an der Columbia University, am Institute for the Study of the Ancient World uh, der New York University sowie an den Universitäten Bonn, Bari und Catania. Sie ist eine ausgewiesene Spezialistin zum altägyptischen Totenbuch, zu altägyptischen Dämonen, zu ägyptischer Magie, aber auch zu Digital Humanities sowie zu Ägyptenrezeption mit einem besonderen 
durchaus exotischen Schwerpunkt auf Afrofuturism und hat äh, zu diesen Themen unzählige Beiträge äh, publiziert. Sie ist Co-Herausgeberin mehrerer Handbücher wie dem Handbuch Ancient Egyptian Religion, A Agencies and Practices oder dem Handbook of the Ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. Gegenwärtig arbeitet sie an der Fertigstellung einer Monographie mit dem Titel Agents of Punishment and Protection, Ancient Egyptian Demonology in the First Millennium BCE. Darüber hinaus ist sie Leiterin des Projektes in The Book of the Dead in 3D, das auf äh, eine 3D-Dokumentation und Annotation altägyptischer sehr gezielt, das unter anderem von der Mellon Foundation gefördert wurde. Digital Humanities sind auch unser gemeinsamer Interessensschwerpunkt und der hat im Jahr 2018 dazu geführt, dass wir zu diesem Thema eben auch zwei Workshops in München und Berkeley im Rahmen des ähm, UCB LMU Research in die Humanities Programm durchführen konnten und ich persönlich hoffe, dass wir diese Zusammenarbeit auch in Zukunft fortführen können, unterbrochen zugegebenermaßen durch die Pandemie, aber jetzt dann hoffentlich auch in neuer Konstellation, beispielsweise mit dem Staatlichen Museum Ägyptischer Kunst hier in München zusammen. Wir freuen uns alle auf deinen Vortrag und ich übergebe dir das Wort. Vielen Dank, Alexander, uh, Professor Hoffmann, Professor Schlüter, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon here in Munich, uh, and good morning, good evening for those at home somewhere else in the world, maybe on YouTube. And uh, first of all, indeed, I wish to thank also the Münchner Zentrum für Antike Welten, MZAV, for the kind invitation to give this lecture, which in a way also summarized the topic of my master class as visiting professor this week. And I'm, I'm really enjoying teaching and lecturing about ancient Egyptian magic in uh, this beautiful setting, a museum with an amazing uh, collection of ancient Egyptian magical culture, and here in uh, this beautiful city of München uh, as well. And um, the scholarly de debate on the definition of magic and its relationship to religion and science in the ancient world is still ongoing and will probably never reach a final consensus. The main difficulty in categorizing uh, social and religious phenomena and practices like magic as well as the concept of religion or science in antiquity, is that the available textual and material sources are not explicative of the emic perspective of those phenomena among the people who experienced it. As an Egyptologist, I've been focusing on the material and textual sources from ancient Egypt, and therefore ancient Egypt will be my main case study today, although I believe that most of the general ideas and interpretations that I will discuss and propose to you, and I hope there will be also a final discussion, I'm really looking forward to hear what you think of all what I will, I'm going to propose and discuss uh, during the lecture, apply also to other cultural contexts of the ancient world. Besides defining magic in its more abstract meaning, we should first of all be aware that often magic is personified in human or divine agents, namely gods, magicians, priests. In particular, in ancient Egypt, Heka, the term mostly used to refer to what we call magic, or in German, Magie or Zauberei. Uh, it's nice that in German there are these two words. We could talk about the difference in meaning but that's uh, for maybe later. Uh, and so Heka is an anthropomorphic god attested already in ritual scenes from the, the third millennium BC, like the one in this slide. And this is a fragmentary register of a painted limestone relief showing Heka here, the first god, taught two goddesses coming from an, un an uncontexted find in the pyramid temple of Sahur at Abusir, 
uh, Fifth Dynasty, and some fragments of it are now in Germany, in, in the Übersee Museum in Bremen and in the Kessner Museum in Hanover. And this representation of the god has been uh, thoroughly discussed by John Baines in an article on the iconography of the god Heka in the Old Kingdom, which points out to the fact that the god's iconography combines divine, but especially human attributes that are typical of fecundity, fecundity figures in other temple scenes. What strikes me here is indeed the humanity of Heka compared to the other gods in the scene. A certain fatness indicating prosperity, the garment of the belt with the strips, which is symbol of uh, peasantry and environment for producing material abundance, the staff especially that he holds. You will see it's different from the staff of the other gods because it's not the typical uh, god's uh, was scepter, um, all indeed by the gods following him. And Baines has interpreted such an iconography as a sort of modified version of figures of mature and successful men evoking the indoor life of a bureaucrat, therefore relating Heka more to the human te than to the divine world. As a matter of fact, Heka and what he represents, namely the creative and transformative power that uh, humankind use for a variety of purposes, but mainly for protection, is very human and sometimes even opposed to the divine will as shown from the rather negative uh, uh, function of certain practices such as those indicated by the Greek term Mageia or by the Hebrew Keshef and the Latin Maleficium, the latter in vogue uh, till medieval, uh, in medieval Europe too. And all those terms which are often translated as magic can in fact mostly indicate human practices against the gods or in some way an illegitimate or ambivalent relation to the ethics of a certain society. And so can we de define magic in, a, in the ancient world in a cross-cultural way? I believe that what the historian of Islam Talal Salah uh, Assad wrote in his essay uh, thinking about belief, religion and politics fits very well in this discourse. To define is to repudiate some things and endorse others. This statement is related especially to the methodology in anthropology of religion in which scholars have been rethinking many basic concepts such as magic and religion in the light of the global transformation occurred especially during the end of the 20th century and so the increasing uh, decolonization movements uh, um, in this period and after World War II. And this is when scholars of anthropology, but also of the ancient world, started to realize how much our concepts and had lent themselves to colonial ends and indeed how much our disciplines arose out of the practice of colonial rule. And I'm quoting here Harding in an essay on religion, it's not what used to be, that's the title, in uh, Exotic No More Anthropology for the Contemporary World. The reassessment of how we define concepts such as religion, magic, and science is still ongoing, especially whether it makes sense to attempt universal definitions that could be valid for a cross-cultural analysis. When analyzing the variety of sources on magic or uh, ritual power in the ancient world, and so written, uh, iconographic, and archaeological, it becomes clear that each of those sources cannot be studied individually since it is the peculiar combination of text, actions, and tools used within a specific ritual performance that makes magic functioning for each culture in a very unique way. We may still use the category of analysis magic as a convention to facilitate a cross-cultural investigation, but at the same time we need to be aware that such a category escapes a unanimous definition and that our focus has to be on the specific context. Contextualizing magic, the title of my lecture, within each pe peculiar cultural milieu, contextualizing each text and object by looking at what we could uh, 
call their biography, especially for object, is therefore the starting point, I think, to, for attempting the understanding of the emic point of view that we all want to reach eventually. We may compare the attempt to define and understand the magic to the variety of studies on the concept of God in religion. God believes has been for too long considered the essence of religion, according to a more Judeo-Christian Islamic prototype. According to such a prototype, a society is religious when it has beliefs in one or more beings that can be seen as God. And in 1994, William Padden wrote in his book, Religious Words, and I quote, Gods are, are a central, unavoidable subject matter for the study of religious life. And in fact, historians of religion have published a large number of studies about the gods of different people and cultures, often forgetting to discuss what is God and if there is even only God in other religions. God should not be used as a basic unit of analysis, neither as if it was a scientific explanatory concept. The God believes uh, cultural model or worldview according to which we can claim that certain people believe certain gods are in the end abstractions, assumptions, assumptions made by scholars in order to more easily describe a particular religion. But the concept of God uh, varies in individual minds, varies enormously in different cultural contexts, so that to attempt defining such a concept uh, unanimously could be risky, and I think the same goes for magic. On the other hand, we can state with certitude that Heika in ancient Egypt is a god, especially represented in a netherworldly seti setting after the New Kingdom. Uh, indeed, except for the rare old kingdom image I have just discussed, where she reminds a fecundity figure, appears to be very human. Most of the images of the god Heka are from the so-called books of the netherworld, such as the Book of the Gates, uh, the Amduat, or some Book of the Dead Papyri, uh, like the one in this slide, uh, where uh, we see Heka on the corner here, holding uh, um, two uh, crossed snakes, symbol of his magical power while accompanying the god Osiris in the Hall of the Two Truth. And uh, Eka also appears in the solar bark together with the Sia perception to aid the solar god in his journey. And here it is clearly connected to the process of creation and transformation. And the god Eka the child, Eka Pahered, appears instead as the child member of the Esna tribe in the Roman period together with the creator god Knum and the goddess Nate, therefore a direct offspring of the demiurge god Knum. However, it is interesting that as a god, Heka does not play a main role in the ancient Egyptian spells of daily magic, where the term is used mostly in order to indicate the non-personified, the all-inclusive effectiveness of magic in the official religion, in the temple cult, but also in personal piety. And so to be great of ma magic, where at Hekao, uh, one of the most popular divine epithets and name of the Ureus, it means to be able especially to prevent, to contrast, or to punish, namely to act according to a magical ritual and a specific aim to fulfill. Uh, where at Tekao is anyway also a cobra headed goddess appearing in ritual scene like this one in Karnak where she stands uh, behind uh, Ramses III. And there have been a few attempts on behalf of historians of ancient religions to replace the term magic with composite expressions such as ritual power, ritual expertise, definitions which because of their general uh, cross-cultural character and their accent on the ritual aspect of magic may fit also a certain aspect of, of the ancient Egyptian magic. Uh, another classical definition of Heka, besides being a god, in the history of studies of ancient Egyptian magic and with reference uh, 
to its place within the cosmo is that of an impersonal, morally neutral, mystical force, is this Borchhaus in the 80s, provided by the gods to humankind, as it is written in the instructions of King Merikara of the Ten Dynasty. It was in order to be weapons to ward off the blow of events that he made magic uh, for them, so for humankind. And um, there are many more, uh, there have been a lot of other definitions given of magic uh, in ancient Egypt that um, I didn't include uh, today, but can be found. There, there is a really wide bibliography. But um, on the basis of all these definitions, could we maybe see magic in ancient Egypt as well as in the ancient world, considering that the Egyptian sources could be open to a series of cross-cultural analysis as a special kind of world-making? I am borrowing this term from the modern American philosopher Nelson Goodman's inspiring essay, Ways of World Making, from 1978, which has inspired and is still inspiring uh, its, uh, generations of historians of the ancient world and historians of science. World making refers to the creation of a world realized through words and images. World making is constrained by coherence, consistency, the fit with intuitive judgment and intelligible purpose, what God Goodman calls the rightness of a version. Right versions make words and are produced by many different kinds of people. When studying ancient magic, its text, representations, and context, it is in fact clear how each people built up a right version of a world where magic become a coherent and consistent reality within that world. The same concept has been adopted by my colleague Francesca Rochberg for the study of Babylonian science and Akkadian cuneiform astronomical text, showing how it is through the understanding that what ancient text, images and objects provide to us are descriptions of their words, namely they write versions of them, that we can better grasp an emic perspective on those texts and objects too. Let's take, for example, in consideration this copper alloy wand and try to understand what it meant by looking for the kind of world making it belongs to. Now in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, this artifact um, is part of a group of mysterious objects found amidst debris at the bottom of a late Middle Kingdom shaft burial called by Kibel, its discoverer, Magician's Tomb. Since the group included other uh, female figurines, tools and papyri related to magical rituals. It was found entangled with air as well, showing an effective usage in real life. And the most popular artifact uh, found, um, oh, okay. um, found um, in the same archeological context to which the snake one uh, very probably belonged is this wooden figure which is among Manchester Egyptian Museum's most intriguing artifacts. It represents a naked female human body with the face of a lion and two movable arms attached with pegs. And in each hand, uh, she holds serpents made of metal and in association, but not connected for sure with this, with this was found a box containing a large number of texts written on papyrus. These are known as the Rameseum papyri, which also contain many magical texts. This evidence suggests that the tomb belonged to a skilled, literate individual who used uh, objects uh, such as our wooden figurine in performance. Literate men, lector priests, ritual experts, even doctors were indeed the magicians that we know from the sources in ancient Egypt. For many of the pieces found in this burial context though, no one is quite sure how she worked, um, um, especially the, the statuette. Uh, that the figurine was used is indicated by signs of alteration, but does she represent a deity or wear a mask? Which divine face is it? A female version of the lion-headed um, dwarf gods Bess or Aha? and are the serpents that she grasped, so rendering them harmless, a symbol of her agency as a magician. 
she raises many questions with difficult answer to get. And we need to know to which version of the ancient Egyptian words she belongs to. For instance, even calling this tomb the magician tombs does not correspond to the fact that the funerary assemblage from this tomb does not provide much indication for number and gender of the owner or maybe of the owners. None of the items bear a name or a title, so there is no direct evidence for any hint as to the identity of the deceased, as shown also by Gianluca Mignacci in a recent publication. And even the papyri advocated as one of the main source for providing information about the identity of their owner were in fact assembled over a long time and certainly belong to different persons and families maybe over the years. However, a large part of these papyri deal um, with healing and protection, namely refer to the world making of what we conventionally are calling magic. It is interesting to note that according to the description of Kibel, it seems that all the papyri were de deposited inside a fairly full wooden box, the, the magician's box was called, which we don't have today, together with reed pens. Um, most of the papyri were in bad state and full of lacunae, like the fragment you can see here. And the contents of the papyri deal with a wide range of topics that show how magic, namely the papyri on health and body protection, was part of a world making where the written documents selected as burial equipment included also literary, epistemological, theological, prescriptions, military, re uh, military reports, administrative accounts, and private notes. Since despite the diversity of subjects, the papyri were found in a single box, namely they were confined in a space by a physical container, as Mignacci notes, I'm quoting here, suggests that they most probably constituted an inten intentional collection aimed at being purposely deposited in, in a burial. And this is from the Middle Kingdom Ramesid Papyri Tomb and its archaeological context, this publication. I believe that this rare archaeological context shows us how, in the world making of the ancient Egyptians, texts for protection and healing that we call magical could fit in a body of non-magical knowledge too and complemented it. All, um, the inclusion of non-funerary, namely non-magical text, is in fact attested also elsewhere in Egypt, since the Old Kingdom and through, uh, throughout the uh, Ramesid period. This fragment in particular is part of an anti-snake spell, which may rhyme in a new edition of this group uh, of magical papyri from the tomb, as identified as a variant of a pyramid text snake spell. And so funerary and daily magic merge together in this kind of text, which is multi-use and multi-purpose on earth and in the netherworld to defend the deceased or the living individual from the same archetypal kind of danger, the venomous reptile. And here I'm switching to animals. Animals feared by humankind as agents of illness and death are part not only of the ancient Egyptian world making, both real and imaginary animals depicted in a variety of scenes and mentioned in text from antiquity have clearly an agency. It is their agency, the way it is described or alluded to in ancient Egyptian images and text that help us to really grasp their function. Agency is also what individualized animals, humans, divine and liminal beings, major and minor gods and spirits, demonic inhabitants of the netherworld, as well as powerful, invisible presences on earth as real protagonists of magic world makings. A discourse on agency in religion and magic will be too long for tonight, but what is important to say is that while we are used to see agency, namely acting for producing something as a quality mainly human and for those who believe in one or more gods, also divine, in many cultures, ancient and modern, agency applies also to the world of animals and plants, which in a sense become human too. Anthropological studies like the one of Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, Cannibal Metaphysics, 
went even further writing that trees, plants, animals, not only have agency, but also inner personas, exactly like humans, and despite their different looks. This notion is what uh, anthropology, in anthropology is called perspectivism, coined by Nietzsche, perspectivismus, uh, as the epistemological principle that perception, knowledge of something are always bound to the interpretative perspectives of those observing it. But then used by Amazonian anthropologists and philosophers such as De Castro, and which I find useful when thinking about animals in the netherworld or magical beings in general, their depictions, the description uh, of them in ancient magical texts and compositions such as the pyramid text, uh, as well as uh, magical papyri for daily use. De Castro did fieldwork with the Northeastern Amazonian Indian group known as the Arawate, st studying what falls under the domain of social and human relations for such Amazonian peoples, and how the modern distinctions between nature and culture, animals and humans, and even descent and marriage ties are effectively inverted. Every uh, entity in the Amazonian cosmologies is conceived as having whatever is bodily form, a soul of a human character, and that all beings thus perceive themselves as humans. And so he makes an example, for instance, of jaguars uh, um, that see themselves as humans and see humans as prey and their own food as that of humans. Successfully negotiating one's relation with other beings therefore require, requires adopting their perspective as shamans do when they become animals in order to know what they see as definite beings. Seeing being here a metaphor of knowing and understanding. What emerges from this perspectivist universe, uh, Viveros de Castro continually emphasize, is an ontology that reverses the terms of one of our most fundamental metaphysical dualism, dualisms. Because perspectivism confers on all beings the same ontological status, and distinguishing between them requires knowing the differences between their bodies, culture becomes the underlying domain uh, uniting beings in Amazonia, and nature the differential separating one. Perspectivism, perspectivism with its multiplicity of approaches could maybe be seen similar to magic and its world in dichotomy, uh, dichotomy with the worldview controlled by logic and the clear distinction between true and false, good and evil. Agents of magic in the ancient world from the human ones, the Magoi priest, doctor who perform magic, to the imaginary composite and hybrid beings operating on a non-earthly dimension converge in the same world making where the borders between humankind and its surrounding are blurred and ambiguous. Those blurred borders are clear in the world of protected creatures to which many animal imageries in magical papyri belong. And the short papyrus that you see represented here, a fragment of it, is a good example. It belongs to the group of so-called amuletic papyri, dated mostly to the Ramesic period and found in disturbed archaeological context in Der El Medina. Most of them have been published, especially by Ivan Koenig, in a series of articles in BVO. And this one, PDM uh, 44, belongs to a lady called Tidy Man and contains different texts, very interesting texts, uh, like a version of the so-called book for protecting the body, Mehet Hao. Um, and this text ends uh, with the protection uh, uh, against evil Heka, namely, namely the bewitchment that could come from a sorcerer. And the final words of the spell recite, don't move or enemy, turn around, where the Hefeti, the enemy, cannot be if not a demonic force to be warded off. In the crowded sketch of the papyrus, we can recognize different divine and protective figures representing the constellations of the north and of the south, involving animal figures, the female hippo for Toweret, Orion Osiris with the crocodile, surrounded by the protective figure of the Ouroboros, the snake biting its tail. 
it is therefore it is therefore the powerful image of protection of magic we could say against the demonic enemy and not the enemy itself itself which is here represented animal figures are here empowered as if human snakes hippos and crocodiles could be maybe compared to the jaguars of the amazonian cosmologies their nature is different their culture is human and therefore they can act as protectors and embody the divine too a multinaturalism effectively prevails here where cosmology functions as a metaphysics and goes well beyond our certainties about nature and culture and right to the core of contemporary philosoph philosophical debate on this matter which will be too long to discuss today. What I think it is important here is that the forms of thought of indigenous peoples accord a central role to relations, virtualities, and becomings, becomings between the human and the animal world in the way the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze claimed already in what he called the other structure, and that can be found in a variety of ancient and modern cultures, from the ancient Egyptian one to the pre-Christian, pre-modern Inuit cultures in Alaska, uh, whose example you can see here represented with the decorative motifs of these two combs. Two, the pictograms on, this, on these combs represent what have been called by Desjardins, uh, who published an article on them, uh, interspecies archers, namely non-human figures engaging in human activities, hunting with an arch in this case. Could we possibly compare those figures with the many magical depictions of hybrid figures in other world makings, such as ancient Egyptian tombs and temples, which do the same? Animals and hybrids, all knives, and engage in magical protecting, magically protecting sacred places in their role of guardians of the hills of the Duat, the Egyptian netherworld, as depicted in Spell 149 of the Book of the Dead, a composition also attested on the walls of the Assyrian chapels in Dendera. Again, the borders here between funerary and daily magic are, bro are blurred, and these are multi-use texts. I believe that such a comparison is possible if we adopt, adopt a multinaturalistic and perspectivistic approach, similar to those used for Amerindian and other native cultures, based on the cultural similitude between human and non-human magical animals. These cultures, according to De Castro, view select species of non-humans, non-humans, specifically those uh, classed as predators and prey, as persons with culture identical to, the, to that of humans. As such, the essence of all persons is humanity, and it is multinaturalism, one culture, many natures, that distinguishes American onto uh, Amerindian ontologies from the multiculturalism, one nature, many culture, of the non-Amerindians. And the focus is here on natures, the physical bodies, and the unique perspective they bestow upon individual consciousness. In ancient Egypt, the inhabitants of the netherworld have bodies too. Their, their body plays a central role in their function as guardians, punisher and disease bringers. When images accompany the text, they can manifest in anthropomorphic hybrid, hybrid and animal shape. But a well-defined category of beings occur, occurs too in the netherworldly Im magical Im imagery, which I call animal powers, since they are depicted exclusively in the shape of animal, the animals that most of the time also symbolize a deity, but not always. They do not have a very well-determined sphere of agency, since they do not have any protective function um, towards the place where they live, neither aim at attacking the disease. They are rather simply inhabiting the netherworld, and their agency can be seen as a sort of propensity to consider the disease passing by as a prey. Therefore, in such an interaction, the disease wants to use magic to ward them off, and Eduardo Cohn, a Canadian anthropologist in his uh, book, uh, How Forests Think, discusses the human sphere to become praise for non-human, mostly animal beings, 
in, rela in relation to the belief in master spirits among the Ecuadorian indigenous Runa people. And Con discusses how non-human entities think by delving deep into semiotics. All beings can represent, produce, and interpret signs. The demonic animal powers I analyze, also in my book on demonology, mostly are represented in Book of the Dead Papyri, like the one in this slide, where the deceased wants to ward off or interact with them in order to get their favor and are mentioned and represented in the group for, of uh, spare for warding off uh, dangerous beings. Animal uh, beings in the netherworld are also powerful manifestation of deities. The disease aims in at acquiring the shape-shifting ability to transform into them. We may think here about the popular spells of transformation attested in the coffin text and Book of the Dead, where becoming an animal, such as a falcon, means to become a god. Here the image of the animal complements the spell, Spell and speech act are all one, as demonstrated by Servajan in a study on the transformation spells of the Book of the Dead, but also by other scholars of ancient magic, such as uh, Frankfurter. This theory goes back to the 1962 book, How to do things with words, uh, of uh, Austin, who discussed the existence of a category of performative uh, uterans, or speech acts, that under the right conditions would effectively change a situation in the world, like uh, baptizing a, a child, for instance, or uh, um, the minister pronouncement of uh, husband and wife uh, for an unmarried couple. In cases like those, the words change the status of the person or object in regards to society. The conditions, Austin po pointed out, are crucial. The officiating figure must have the authority to make the statement. The object of the declaration must be in the appropriately receptive and situa situational condition for the change. And the declaration itself must be uttered according to tradition or to a canon. And all these conditions can be found in the ancient Egyptian spells to transform into animals. The officiating figure being the magician or transfigured deceased, the object of the declaration being the animal focus, focused on, a falcon, a crocodile, a sparrow, among others, a divine manifestation ready to empower the deceased body with shape-shifting skills. And finally, the declaration is the incantation that goes back to the pyramid text and the canonical corpus of funerary magic that finds its peak in the New Kingdom Book of the Dead and in the Ramesses spells of daily magic like those attested in the Rameseum papyri that we mentioned. I believe we could apply the same structure to many other magical practices from the ancient world without mentioning the fact that the continu continu continuity and transformation of Egyptian motifs in the Greco-Roman and late antique periods in Greek, Demotic or Coptic is by now well attested. We will return on that at the end of this lecture. And the cross-cultural analysis of magical practices in these cultures extend over the Western world uh, into uh, the African and Asian worlds uh, through uh, studies of comparative historical linguistics, anthropology, religious studies, and archaeology. In the ancient Egyptian funerary compositions, speech act in magical texts where animal and demonic hybrids as agents of danger and punishment are mentioned, is always accompanied by iconographies that depict the agent's bodies placed in a specific landscape or space that speaks out of the kind of agency they have. Guardian figures called watchers, murderers, wanderers, squatting ones, are generally depicted close to gates, doors, and liminal uh, passages and spaces, while punishers and animal powers act in areas devoted to the final ju judgment, like the Lake of Fire or the Hall of the Two Truths, or are identified in a netherworldly space where the deceased is warding them off with the gesture of pointing the finger or spearing them. I like to differentiate la land, landscape, space, and place following Tim Ingold's take on the subject in his book, The Perception of the Environment, the landscape is not the same as space, according to Ingold's dwelling perspective. The landscape is a sort of enduring record 
of uh, a mythological past in which to engage with the past and its spaces and places. If applied to the ancient Egyptian depictions and textual descriptions of the netherworld, for instance, the latter is the landscape whose spaces and places are the different regions of the deceased travel through, and the gates guarded by demons they must be uh, passed through. The importance of the landscape in the magical agency of the Book of the Dead, compositions, and in magical text in general, it's self-evident when analyzing the sources on different media, from papyrus to tomb wall, it generates from the need of protecting the space where humankind lives on earth and where the deceased travels after death. Magic and space are closely connected in many cultures in ancient Egypt, in particular through the concept of protection, as ex excellently described in Thai's book Magi und Raum, and Asman also talked in an essay Invisible Religion on Situative Verankerung, uh, situ situational anchorage provided by images used for protecting a space. The landscape on earth, in particular the desert, is connected to demonic animals, also in other ancient religions where it generates a, a topography of catastrophe, as mentioned in uh, David Frankfurter's Evil Incarnate. And even when there are no images depicting the landscape and spaces where the demonic figures function and where the encounter with the disease occurs, generally the text mentions the place where each specific being lives or comes from. See, for instance, the demonic crocodiles of spell 31 and 32 of the Book of the Dead, which are distinguished between each other according to the cardinal point where they come from. Their vignette represents the deceased while spearing the four crocodiles, which are often uh, repeated twice in the same section, as in this papyrus, as if uh, intensifying the magic against the noxious reptile through our red petition. These spells occur uh, also on coffins, uh, showing how central were considered by the ancient Egyptians in order to protect the deceased uh, into the space of the netherworld. <coughs> and in the core of the text that you can read on screen, uh, you can see how each crocodile uh, is um, identified by coming uh, from one of the cardinal points uh, and living uh, on something. So back crocodile of the west living on the untiring stars, crocodile of the east, uh, living on the mud of their weeds, uh, of the north, living on this arm, and so on. In many other epithets of inhabitants uh, of the netherworld, often the cultic place of origin is mentioned in order to collocate the creature in space and provide a belonging, such as the mysterious fighters in Heliopolis, Ahau and Myunu, in spell 28 of the Book of the Dead, here, one of those fighters is represented in a peculiar vignette um, as a lion bass like creature, more animal than human, revered by the human disease who offers his earth to him. And you can note also the very nice hieroglyph that uh, determinate the, the name, which is, I think, is a unique. I never found a um, another variant of this hieroglyph. Demonic animal, hybrid body, special dimension form, therefore, a unity, while the space where the demon lives contributes to her, his own identity, while at the same time, the demonic figures characterize and own each particular uh, landscape. And so the belief in a medical, mythical dimension where animals and non-human beings are agents in shaping a timeless magical landscape that can be dangerous for humankind can be found uh, not only in ancient religions, for instance, uh, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, where composite animals and monsters are placed outside the city landscape, as if owning uh, the chaotic space, uh, but also in modern society of hunters and gatherers. Therefore, each category of animal demonic agents of the netherworld needs to be analyzed in, clo in close relation um, <coughs> uh, to the space and landscape where they function the place of belonging uh, of these guardian figures, for instance, in the screen is not the same as the space of their images, uh, what the images protect, namely the tomb and its equipment. And as Rooney or the wrote in, a in his recent book, Seeing Perfection, the images of the guardians in tombs and on coffins and papyri 
are not simply representations of the realm of the dead that existed in a different space, but rather a tool for transforming the tomb or ritual space into the realm of the dead itself. The strategies for protecting the burial of ancient Egypt are numerous and varied, from the very technical ones, uh, implying architectural skills to the vast array of magical practices, objects, and text uh, for the tomb interior and exterior. And so the occurrence of uh, hybrid demonic guardians in the tomb tombs should be also seen as one as integral part of the strategies of tomb protection that should function for eternity. The importance of the space in magical practices is especially evident also in the magical books of the Greek and Roman periods and throughout late antiquity in the Greek magical papyri. Uh, the study of the visual elements of the PGM has only recently been focused on after having been neglected for a long time due to the generally unclear or complex relationship of these drawings to the text copied in the vicinity, as well as because of their poor aesthetic quality in comparison to the beautifully illustrated magical papyri of the pharaonic period. Uh, some of these images are, however, of clear ancient Egyptian origin and seem to derive from uh, models taken from the Book of the Dead or other pharaonic funerary composition, compositions. Such an iconic transmission shows that the ancient Egyptian build the Zauber, the, the magic of images, was still considered effective in the new socio-cultural context where the PGM were composed and used. A very explicative example of magical drawings of pharaonic origin uh, which have been transported into the Greek magical papyri and connected to the space where the ritual took place is the figure of a scarab occurring in PGM 2. Scarabs are amuletic uh, images par excellence, widely spread in the ancient Egyptian religious imagery as well as in the whole uh, Medi ancient Mediterranean. Um, they occur in magical objects such as the so-called scarabs of the earth. We have a lot in this museum and they're very popular objects in general. PGM2, um, namely Papyrus Berlin 5226, is a magical handbook dated to the fourth century with spells and instructions for receiving direct oracular visions um, and including also a very popular sketch of the Akephalos, a figure that has been discussed widely by scholars. And the drawing of the scarab here is part of an inscription for a doorpost of the bedchamber, which serves to define the space protected by magic. Below the door, inscribe the scarab as it stands here, having anointed it with the blood of a goat outside your bedchamber. So a magical drawing, but also a drawing that has a very practical uh, use. It's, it's part of the instructions on how to do magic. And so finally, I'd like to spend a few words on the agents of magic, those who in ancient Egypt were called Hekayu, and in English we call magicians. Magicians are powerful figures uh, in ancient literatures. It is in fact easier to find descriptions of them in literary text rather than try to understand their character from magical text, which do not explicitly reveal much about the magician as an individual and performer neither on his specific social identity and on the way he was perceived by the patients or victims of the magic he was performing. Maus, in his pivotal study on magic, already pointed out to the importance of social consensus for a magician. In literary text, and so you can read the, here a part where he talks about this. In literary text, although they are generally described as human, they can reach and share supernatural powers thanks to their secret restricted knowledge of the written spells for their skills in performing rituals. And the use here of the male personal pronoun is intentional since in general the magician figures we know from the text is a male with a few exception of wise women, uh, the record, uh, who look like local healers of modern good witches. We'll see in the next slide. The study of magical texts, both uh, of more strictly funerary or of daily use, 
is however helpful in catching a glimpse of the sociocultural context of magic. Very often we learn about the ritual tools used by the magician as well, therefore they provide precious information on the materiality of magic, on the agency of the professional ritualists performing it, since they often also contain the ritual instructions for the magician to follow. It is instead mainly thanks to the literary text and by integrating the information that we can gain from them with the descriptions on magician deeds coming from other non-literary sources that we can attempt to define the role of the Hekaio through the different periods of the long pharaonic Greco-Roman history in ancient Egypt. The dominance and popularity of the genre of stories recounting the exploit of magician is well known uh, um, and studied especially in demotic literature uh, with the famous narrative of Setna I and II. Um, generally, magicians in ancient Egypt tales are learned men, uh, and in ancient Egypt, the most commonly encountered figure of magician literary sources is the priest in the temple. It's clear from most common priestly titles, these temple magicians could also act as compilers, performers of the magical spells and rites. And so the Herieb, uh, literally the carrier of the scroll, represents the lector priest reciting incantation. We have the Herieb Eritep, uh, abbreviated Heritep, the chief lector priest. And uh, this te uh, term actually is transcribed as RTB in a Neo-Assyrian neo document listing the court personnel, uh, probably under Esaradon and indicated uh, Egyptian foreigner diviners, mostly in more in particular dream interpreters, together with other kind of conjurers, uh, uh, the Asipu, uh, doctor, scribal specialist. And um, um, we have, um, of course, another important figure uh, as a magician is that of the Sunu, um, the doctor or physician, uh, who, however, in many occurrences also bears priestly title associated to magic, uh, can be called Sao, protector, maybe medicine man. We know of the king, the deity in ritual uh, scenes in the temple, also doing magic. The figure of the foreigner is, uh, especially in literary texts, presented as a powerful magician. And even the woman, uh, the foreign women, are sort of powerful witches, while the rechet, uh, the, the, the one who knows um, is a wise woman, not sure if to say that we can call her as a good witch, um, but um, we have other uh, figure of um, magician, female magician uh, in other culture. Of course, we could compare a super example from Near Eastern text on female sorcerers, such as in one so-called uh, Maklu anthropotropic uh, ritual where a female magician, a kasaptum, seems to bewitch a victim, as well as in a number of Jewish texts mentioning uh, women accused of uh, witchcraft. Although from the surviving ancient Egyptian sources we do not get any hint of an official prohibition to women to do magic, we could assume anyway that probably there were similar female figures also in Egypt as in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia and in the Jewish world. Um, it is also interesting uh, that uh, um, herdsmen could act as a magician, as shown in, in scenes carved on the walls of the mast Mastabas of the Old Kingdom. And uh, Robert Rittner has been uh, analyzing this text in his mechanics of uh, Ancient Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian magical practices. Uh, there is a so-called water spell uh, added to those uh, that goes together with those scenes, the Esumu, to make the crocodiles blind and, and so not harmful. And so here, herdsmen differ from the learned magicians since they possess a sort of inner wisdom, uh, a local specific knowledge of uh, 
certain apotropaic spells against crocodile. But uh, Robert Rittner also noted that uh, in most of these mastaba scenes depicting the herdsmen while physically performing magic through the apotropaic gesture of pointing out the finger, there is also a standing or sitting figure with a priestly attitude, uh, which is probably the one reciting the spell, so suggesting that the written knowledge and recitation of the spell belong to a scribal specialist, while the herdsman only possess the practical and performative skills for doing magic. Differently from uh, literary text, um, where the figures of the magicians are so well individualized, in the, um, in the magical text, the Ekai seems instead to nullify himself and his own personality. Although during their performance they could more easily directly invoke the gods, in most texts they rather, uh, they rather allude to their mythological accounts, and it's because they act according to the principle of analogy, very important in magic, try to find an analogy between the problem they have to solve and the divine, divine words and stories. And so the, by evoking the myths, the magician individuality and personality um, do not matter almost anymore. And he becomes the deity invoked, practically nullifying himself, like we read in a, in a magical spell from uh, Papyrus Harris 501, uh, where is he said, um, indeed, uh, it is... Uh, um, it is not I who have said it, it is not I who have repeated, it is Maga, the son of Set, that has said it. It is the one who has repeated it. In conclusion, can we define an ontology of agents of magic? When having to choose the terminology to define ontologies, I think it is important to focus on the question of translation versus understanding of a concept when uh, we face two languages with different conceptual systems. As discussed by Lakoff, George Lakoff, with uh, speakers uh, um, in his book, Woman, Fire, and Dangerous Things, speakers of different languages and belonging to different cultures still share same basic experiences, as for instance, beliefs in uh, demons, and conceptualize the same domains of experiences to roughly the same degree. The problem of translation when working with magical text can be overcome when we realize that understanding is not always a direct outcome of translation. As Lakoff wrote in his book, translation can occur without understanding, and understanding can occur without the possibility of translation. The academic discourse on magic cannot prescind from translation, but each translation carries its own issues and assumptions. So what is a useful translation in the case of magical terms and text? Certainly one where the ambiguity of the language of magic is not forced into becoming understandable, one that allow and understand beyond translation. Heka, Mageia, magical thinking in general remain untranslatable, but their function may still be grasped by contextualizing those phenomena into their own cultural setting. Importantly, as noted also by Frankfurter in the edited volume Guide to the Study of Ancient Magic, and I quote, we must be extraordinarily careful not to get hung up on the language of ritual text, whether in the original languages or how it sounds in translation where we think there is all humility and a sense of ethics, or conversely, a moral and mechanistic assumptions about selfish manipulation and command, there may simply be scribal idioms, local conventions, and a fundamental overarching concern with efficacy on the part of the scribe. And I end quote here. And so I believe that efficacy Ak in ancient Egyptian is the key here. When looking at magical cultures of the ancient world and to their ontologies and the right versions of realities, the first question we should try to answer is uh, how did they imagine that this, this ritual or spell was going to be effective for them? In other words, uh, how did they work their magic? Um, thank you. Thank you.